Welcome to It's All Your Fault on True Story FM, the one and only podcast dedicated to helping you identify and deal with the most challenging human relationships, those involving someone who may have a high conflict personality. I'm Megan Hunter, and I'm here with my co-host, Bill Eddy. Hi, everybody. We are the co-founders of the High Conflict Institute in San Diego, California, where we focus on training, consulting, and educational programs and methods, all to do with high conflict. In this episode today, we are happy to introduce you to a good friend and colleague from Israel, Michal Fine, uh, to discuss a law that she wrote for Israel and was passed in 2014. It's a law that had significant impact on parents and children, a law looked at at by those in other countries with respect and probably with some longing. But first, a couple of notes. If you have a question about a high conflict situation, send it to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or through our website at highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast, where you'll also find all the show notes and links. We're so grateful to our listeners, and I'm sure you'll enjoy this conversation today. So I want to first uh, introduce our very special guest who's joining us all the way from Israel, Michal Fine. And I know I'm not saying it right, and I promised you no, listeners okay. last week. <laughs> she'll, she'll help us with that later. Um, so she is a leading family and divorce lawyer in and a member of the Israeli Bar Association since 1999. She's a mediator and a practicing collaborative divorce lawyer. Um, which, uh, as our listeners know, those are two passions of ours. Um, and she's known for her legal creativity and problem solving approach, uh, to law and an awareness for her clients' well-being. So, uh, she's very much in alignment with what, what Bill and I do and, and the, you know, the, the goals of the High Conflict Institute. She's a social activist dedicated to change the culture of divorce. She is a member of NGO organizations such as the Association for Peaceful Divorce and the International Academy of Collaborative Practitioners, known as IACP. Uh, it, she drafted this uh, bill that we're going to discuss today for um, M.K. Marav Mekiela, probably another name I've butchered, um, <laughs> which and led the legislation of the Family Dispute Settlement Law. And she was later appointed by the Israeli Ministry of Justice as a public representative. So this is what we'll be talking about today. And I just want to welcome you to our podcast. And I'd love for you to say a quick hello to our listeners and tell us a little about yourself. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. It's an honor. Well, I'm an Israeli, <laughs> born and raised in Tel Aviv, sunny, warm, by the sea city with a very a vibrant cultural life, you can say that. It's a very happy place uh, to be living in. Uh, so here I grew up and here I raised my three children. I've got... A big girl who is 19, a gorgeous, lovely young lady, and two boys, age 15 and a half, all teenagers in one house. It's a big one half family. Oh, <laughs> teenagers. teenagers. Wow. A lot. Yeah, <laughs> That's a not, lot. A dull, not a dull <laughs> moment no. in our house. And you have this a lovely husband who is an artist and a very creative man and loves you very much. I I know yes. this. <laughs> yes, I'm blessed with yes. that. <laughs> yes, indeed. Now we we know where you grew up already. We, we kind of go into our fun questions with all of our guests. And the first one is, where did you grow up? And obviously, it's Israel. But the next one is, do you have a favorite book or movie? Are you a reader or a watcher or both? Both. Both. <laughs> both. I, I'm always reading something. Most of the time, a couple of books at the same time. Oh, you're one of those. <laughs> yes, I'm one of those. Picking up one book and continuing with another and again and again. I've got like a very big pile of books near my bedside. Uh, so I, I read all the time. And 
all of our family is uh, passionate about the movies. We all go together to most of the new, newest movies that uh, come out. But I also was very passionate about giving my kids a film education, you can say that. So I show them all the classics and the musicals, which I, which I adore. So it's, they know most of the musicals by heart, I think. Wow. But what I love the most, you can see that I, you will see a very fast that I'm a incapable, uh, romantic. <laughs> I, I like the Princess Bride. <gasps> That's oh, my favorite that. one. Yeah, I think I saw that many times. First time I saw that, I was in the army. So here in Israel, it's a mandatory service. So it's the long, movie long mandatory. Time ago. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it is. <laughs> oh, that's a great movie. Yeah, that's a great movie. But it's really hard to pick just one. And another movie that I saw many, many, many times. Usually I don't see a movie more than once, but there, 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 there's the movie of the, the Cohen brothers about family lawyers, uh, intolerable cruelty that I like to see and laugh about my own profession. Intolerable cruelty. Interesting. Yeah. That, does that translate to high conflict? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. That, that, that says a lot, I think, about the uh, profession. Yeah. Okay. And Interesting. That's the, uh, yes. And, and the question of the professional identity of a family lawyer, that's the question that really uh, entangles me. And the movie has a special edge about it, so I can relate. <laughs> huh. Bill, have you seen that movie? I haven't. I'm not a movie person, and I haven't seen that movie, but I've already put that on my list, so I definitely <laughs> will. <laughs> Same here. Good. Thanks for the recommendation. Um, <laughs> all right. So the last fun question, if you could sit down for a conversation with one person from any point in history, who would it be? Wow. That's a very, very big one. That's a very difficult question. I, I don't know if I, if I can really uh, cultivate one person from all of you, the humanity, uh, history humanity, of humanity, but I would really love to to have, would have loved to sit down with Ruth Bader Ginsburg mm. and have a good talk with her as a woman lawyer, as a feminist, as a social activist. She had a long, hard way, but she accomplished so much. So I think that will be a good, a good one. Yep. That would have been a very stimulating conversation and a long one, I'm sure. I'm sure also. That's good. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. It's, I, I just think it's very interesting. So let's kind of dive into the, you know, the, the good stuff, right? So, um, when we first met, uh, several years ago, you had already drafted this bill called the Family Dispute Settlement Law. But let's go back to the time before the law was drafted and passed. How did it come about? What led up to it? It took a long time to really write it in a way that it can pass, okay, uh, in the Israeli parliament, which is the Knesset. It started, uh, if I recall, at the 2005 when the first committee, one of the committees of the Justice Department in Israel has drafted a set of recommendations of how to uh, increase mediation rates uh, in family disputes. But it was written and was put in the drawer, as, as they say. It couldn't be pushed uh, any further than that. And I can tell you from my point of view that I uh, returned to my studies as a, as a master's student in 2011, and I started to ask questions 
many questions about the relationship between law and society. And, and I particularly, I wanted to know how can people can be encouraged to choose collaborative divorce? And how can we do that in Israel? It was a really pr- a problematic question that many of us, many of the lawyers that wanted to practice collaborative law in Israel were struggling with because the main obligation of uh, collaborative law is uh, avoid going to court. And that wasn't possible for us as family lawyers in Israel. And to understand why it's not possible for a family lawyer in Israel to avoid going to court, you need to understand about the system a bit. Uh, Israel is a Jewish democracy, meaning we have a dual system, a religious one and a civil one. In particular, in matters of uh, marriage and divorce. Okay, it's a very ancient system. And this ancient system uh, means for us, that for a family lawyer in Israel, that we have a problem with not going to court. Because if you were to ask um, a family lawyer in Israel at that time, uh, what do you recommend uh, to a client at your first meeting? He or she would answer you with two words. Seize jurisdiction. Okay, that means that first thing you have to do is submit a lawsuit to the jurisdictions that is better for your client. And as a family lawyer, you have an obligation to explain that. Uh, to your client, and you have to explain a, a term called concurrent jurisdiction, okay? The term that uh, explains the dual system of law here in Israel. Because if you find yourself uh, in the religious court or in a civil court, it's a big difference. And you can probably imagine why. <laughs> right. I rem- I recall when I was in Israel hearing the term race to the courthouse, right? Exactly. One one gender is going toward toward the the religious court and the other is going to the civil court. That's really the matter because the laws in the religious uh, court differ from the those in the civil court. And the laws that apply to both court systems also differ given to the different uh Judicial methods, legal tradition, and, and world views. So, the ba- the main difference is it, is around the questions of the question of fault. Okay, so uh, while in the civil um, family court there's a no fault divorce approach, in most religious courts, you know, we have a rabbinical court for the Jews. A Sharia for the Muslim, a different one for Druze, a different one for Catholic, but I will call them all together uh, religious courts, okay? Because in all religious courts, if the parties do not agree to end the marriage, the party that wants to end it must prove that the other party is to blame for bringing the relationship to an end. In this situation, both parties are anxious to seek to restrictions in the court that is most favorable to their individual position. Okay? So, once a lawyer meets a new, a new client, he or she are obligated to tell them about the race to the court. Okay? So, here's my dilemma. As a collaborative lawyer, I would like to encourage people not to go to court. But as a professional family lawyer, I know that I'm obligated to tell them to rush to court. So what do I do? I, That's called a in, dilemma. In a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a very, very tough spot. The race uh, for, for authority is a big issue, especially if you have a situation of betrayal, 
a case of homosexuality, things that are very difficult to handle in their religious court. Okay, these are, as one can say, offenses that may cost the guilty party a great deal of property, or in some cases, even the custody of the kids. So it's a very big issue, okay? Uh, on the other hand, in civil court, we argue for no false divorce, and these so-called offenses, such as sexual orientation, carry no economic uh, consequences, okay? So the race through authorities is a big issue, and the race uh, has developed due to a Supreme Court uh, ruling that meant that the first uh, court to which a lawsuit is submitted will be the court to decide on the concurrent issues. Okay? The family court cannot give you a divorce. Okay? The divorce itself is a religious matter in Israel. A marriage is a religious matter and the divorce is a religious matter, but the matters that surround the divorce, all the things around it, the civil court, the family court can decide. So the race means that anyone who is even beginning to consider the possibility of divorce should be aware of this and be advised by a family lawyer, which a court system is better under the specific circumstances and then race for it. Okay, there's even matters of uh, um, inheritance of property that are different between the courts and sometimes yeah, the rabbinical court gives a decision that's not consistent with the civil uh, laws and one needs to go to the Supreme Court in order to change that ruling. So it, it's a very complicated uh, situation. And um, due to that, to be a collaborative lawyer in Israel 10 years ago was something that we struggle. Uh, how can we do that and not be negligent? Okay, we had a big question of a uh, professional responsibility. What will we do? We have, like, as Pauline Tesla says, it's a cognitive uh, dissonance. Mm, cognitive dissonance, yeah. Right. Yeah, right. because you know that going to court is going to be very harmful for the fa- for the entire family, especially for the children. But you have, on the other hand, the law that forces you as a professional, as a responsible professional, to explain to your client about the race to the authorities. Yeah. Can I jump in and ask, how did your law fit into all of that? The law you proposed, how did it fit into all of that? And did it get much resistance? Yeah. Okay, let's let's start from the beginning. What the law that I was part of changed is the legal default. Before it was implemented, we had, we still have, okay, the race for the authorities. So if we look at it as a, as a, a default law, the default is to submit a lawsuit as soon as possible because the race of the authorities. What the new law did was to change that, because according to it, you do not submit a lawsuit. You don't start a family dispute, not in the family court and not in the rabbinical court, not in a religious court. You don't start it with submitting a lawsuit. You start it with a different way, and that's the change. And the, when what you do is you submit a motion to settle, which is 
a form with only your name, your ID number, your phone number, your address, and your spouse and your children the same. Family name, first name, date of birth, phone number, address, phone number, email, max. You don't get to tell the story at that piece of paper. It's a very short piece of paper. You don't have any place to put any details beside that initial personal information. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not the only thing it does. After one submit a, a motion to settle, there's a period of timeout. 60 to 75 days in which no one can submit a lawsuit. Okay? So we have a mandatory timeout that forces people to negotiate, okay? But there's another thing. Mm. <laughs> During this period of time, the 60, the 60 or 75 days, the parties will sit down with a social worker of the state, funded by the state, and will talk without lawyers, without any lawsuit at the background. And the social worker will try to facilitate a conversation and to see whether they can agree to continue to mediation, to collaborative process. So the motion to settle, once it's starting the procedure, it's completely different Yeah, than submitting a lawsuit. That sounds great, because I think here we've, we've, we're have we moving in that direction, but very slowly. So did you get a lot of resistance to this? Um, did it go through the legislature? Wow. <laughs> How did it get approved? <laughs> well, it was a miracle. I think ah. it was a miracle. It got approved. I don't have <laughs> a bad answer. I, I actually... Uh, M.K. Merak Ali did an amazing parliament work, uh, and she managed um, to negotiate a situation in which all, not not all, but most members of the Israeli parliament were were um, behind uh, this bill, and they all were joined by the notion they they have a chance to do something good mm. for the people of Israel. Excellent. So it really was a remarkable point in our parliament history to see the coalition and the opposition collaborative together in order to uh, move on with this bill. And um, it became a law. Fantastic. We had a lot of um, voices that were calling this uh, revolution, so-called. They called it, uh, they found it offensive to lawyers, first of all. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they saw that as, as unfortunately, as like, like an attack on their professional identity, saying that lawyers are doing bad things to their clients. But that wasn't my way of thinking. Okay. My way of thinking was that this is an opportunity for our uh, profession as a lawyer. I'm talking as a family lawyer. It, it's, a, it's an opportunity to evolve and to do better by our clients so we can do more negotiations do more agreements, um, put less time on submitting lawsuits and more time on negotiations. And that's what really happened eventually. Yeah, say a little about it getting implemented. 
Were there forms? Were there procedures? And did the professionals really shift their approach? I'll start with the end, <laughs> okay? I think the uh, lawyers as a profession are great in adapting to social changes. Mm. Uh, they're really excellent in that. And uh, they did what they do best. They learned how to adapt and change the way they're handling the clients um, not all the way, but in the beginning of the proceedings. And it's very, the beginning is very important. The simulation of the law took a lot of time. We started, implemented the law a, a year and a half after it, it was passed in the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament. And we had to um, establish a new procedure with new uh, forms and new regulations uh, in order to uh, make sure that we can take into account all kind of circumstances uh, that can happen because we have the legal proceeding postponement period, the 60 or 75 days that one cannot submit a lawsuit. And we had to regulate the situation in which one can ask for uh, assistance uh, from the court in cases which are urgent. Okay, so we had to find out in many circumstances what to do, in different and many circumstances what to do. And we had um, uh, to regulate that, and we did that in order to do the law to uh, be implemented. A few years ago, I had a um, the enormous privilege of of being in Israel, and I think it was the, the first time we met in person. And uh, that this law had been in, implemented for a little over two years at that point. So um, I I had the really wonderful privilege of of speaking to you and a, a group of family law stakeholders about the law and possible ch possible changes to it in the future. What impressed me at the time was. Uh, not only the ability of the lawyers to adapt to this, but for, I guess, the judiciary and the, the legislative bodies to accept and give families an opportunity to meet with social workers and to learn some skills um, be during that timeout period, right? To, to learn how to negotiate a little bit better and other things like that. So at, at that time, you had some data from the government about the number of claims that were submitted to the court. What were you seeing at that two-year mark? And um, now here, you know, several years later, about the six-year mark, has it stayed the same or changed? Well, we see uh, that the data is the same. The first year of the implementation of the law, we saw a sudden drop of 70% in the uh, claims that were submitted. And we were shocked and we said to one another, this cannot be true. And eventually it wasn't true. <laughs> okay. 70%, was, seven zero. The first year, yeah, the first, the first year. year was like a shock period. <laughs> okay. And, and from the second year on, the numbers have, the, the numbers settled. The numbers were the same from the second year on. And what we see is a drop that is at least a, a, a less dramatic, not 70%, but 45%. Okay, the numbers of claim filed in the second year of the law implementation, if we see that, if we look at the numbers, uh, at the, um, the year in 2018, there were about 25,000 claims, okay, uh, but the number uh, of claims in the um, pre previous year before the implementation of the law were 40, uh, 46. 46,000? 46, 46,000. So the drop was 45%. Wow. And it sustained, the, it stayed the same, okay? So... We came to the conclusion 
the, the new law that was passed in 2014 reduced litigation in family conflicts by more than 40%. That's huge. That was amazing. We didn't think that was even possible. And I'm happy, I'm very, very happy about it. <laughs> yeah, we see the smile on your face. <laughs> yeah. Our listeners don't, but I'm sure they can hear it in your voice. So when we say the claims um, submitted to the court decreased, then those folks were settling um, their divorces out of court through mediation. Is that what the result was or the impact? We don't know that. Mm. We need more research in order to say that. There were uh, three types of research done uh, in the last six years about the implementation of the law. What we came to understand that reducing the incentive uh, for litigation does not necessarily increase the use of ADR processes. We did see lawyers adapt quickly and marvelously, meaning that lawyers were now doing a lot of more negotiating before submitting lawsuit, before submitting a, a motion to settle. Uh, we saw parties submitting a motion to settle and then going to mediation. We saw people going to mediation without submitting a, a motion to settle uh, because they knew that will happen anyway. Okay, they will, ha they will have to sit down and talk. But we don't have numbers, we don't have data that can actually tell us after our research that we have more settlements. That we cannot say in, in this uh, point of time. Well, maybe some of the parties got back together <laughs> and didn't divorce at all. <laughs> Who knows? That's also that's also <laughs> one of the things that can happen in family matters. You know, we say that in Israel we have Shabbat. Okay, people, people go back to work and school on Sunday, so we have a, 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 a Sunday conflict. You know, the people after the weekend goes to court and said, oh, I cannot bear him. I cannot stand her. I want a divorce. So that is not happening anymore because they have to submit a motion to settle. That's and funny. That has a that has a mediating impact immediately. Yeah. You know, the, the time out, I, I call it. I call it a timeout procedure because it really forces people to sit down and think before acting. You cannot run for it as you used to do before. All right. Let me ask, ask another question that, that actually we hadn't thought about before. And that is, what about domestic violence? In other words, what if there's an urgent need for a restraining order against someone who's been perpetrating domestic violence right from the start? Because once that person knows their, their spouse or partner is leaving them is when it escalates the most often. Yeah, I know. That 60 to 75 day waiting period. Is there a way to get a restraining order of protection before? One, one can get a protection order in any time. Okay. The, the, this particular law does not extend above the law that it can give you a restraining order. Okay. The, um, in Israel, there is a, a family domestic violence law. And this law does not apply to it. The court is open for a, submitting a restraining order all the time. Okay. But not making divorce decisions. That's the difference that your law... That's the difference, impacts. yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. But in that matter of family uh, violence, domestic violence, we, we did see that submitting a motion to settle helps women in crisis because they have 
more time to regroup and rethink and get advised about what they want to do when they have the restraining order intact. So the combination helped. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You can have a restraining order or you can be in a, in a shelter. Okay. Many women go here to a shelter. And while the woman is in a shelter, she submits a motion to settle and it buys her time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So we initially, we initially thought that these women will need to, um, shorten the period of the, of the timeout. And we regulated a rule that enables them to do that. Mm. But we found that they, they don't want to do that. They want the time to regroup. So that was an interesting outcome. Fascinating. Yeah. So, so let me ask just about mediation. You know, that, that's, that was my primary career, uh, even though I became a lawyer and was also a therapist. But does this, did this significantly increase the use of mediation? And I guess with that, lawyers becoming mediators, because that's what we've seen in the United States. Well, I can tell you that that's what I feel but I don't have the numbers to support that. I can say there is a, a big increase in demand for mediation courses, for collaborative training, for professionals. That I can say. I can also f uh, say that uh, my uh, mediator's friends have more work, but I don't have that in official numbers. Okay, that's so. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> that's what I can say. I need to be responsible to my answers. And you are. Yeah. So, my, my last question. So, with the pandemic over the last three years, have you seen uh, conflict increase and divorce rates increase? Uh, conflict in families and divorce rates, and I suppose domestic violence also, which we've seen here. Well, as I told you before, we see an increase in violence all over the country mm -hmm. in all matters of life. So something has changed after the pandemic. I think people lost their uh, patience and we do see that there's many children in uh, emotional distress. Mm. I called it the mental health pandemic. That's after the pandemic. So we do see that. We see a lot of kids needing professional mental health uh, help. And I cannot say there's a change in a... Um, the rates of divorce. I cannot say there is an increase. The, the numbers are high in Israel anyway. Every third couple is getting a divorce. Mm. Wow. So it's high anyway. What we do see is an increase in alienation cases. Mm. Uh, we do see that more children and need more uh, help. We do see that. But there's no research or no official data. That's only um, the sense that I'm getting from my, in, my professional environment. And the violence rates are high in Israel now in a way that hasn't been ever before. We see that there was a crisis and everybody's trying to deal with that um, the best they can. Mm, anxiety is high. Tension is high from many, Very. from many sources, um, which, which filters down into families. So last question, what is your hope for the future of family law in Israel? Wow. 
That's, that's a big very, one. I keep asking God. you really big questions. <laughs> really big questions. Well, um, if we can change the system, be more a democracy and less a religious state, that would be better, I think, for, for everyone. The dual system, especially in family matters, is very hard for everyone. Okay, I hope that, that someday people that want to go to the religious court can go to the religious court. But people that are not religious, that are secular, are not forced to get a divorce at the uh, religious court, which is the situation today. But because in Israel today, because we're a Jewish democracy, the religious has a very big part in our life. Sure. A marriage and divorce in Israel are a religious ceremonies. You cannot marry only in a civil way and you cannot get a divorce only in the civil way, only in the religious way. So that's very difficult uh, for many people here in Israel. And I hope the people of Israel can work it out uh, in a peaceful way and can come about to a new agreement about the way of life here in Israel, that it will be more a democracy and less a religious one. Although I, I, although I wish it to stay a Jewish state, okay? Being Jewish without being so religious is possible. So I hope that will be the way for us. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michal, for, for joining us and sharing all of these uh, very interesting and, and probably challenging from um, the perspective of an Israeli. Uh, you know, th these are tough things you've done. And, you know, we admire the work you and others have done there in Israel to make this impact on families. It's 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 a big deal, and um, I I'm sure our listeners will understand that, especially those who are involved in in family law and legislation and in the profession. So um, wherever you are today, listening to this, we hope it's been very um, fascinating and and um, inspiring. So uh, we're very very grateful to you, our listeners, for joining us, and thank you again, Michal, for for joining us today. And I'm sure we'll have you back sometime. <laughs> We'd love to to do that. Thank you for having me. So next week um, in our episode, we'll talk about why connection is so important in high conflict interactions. In fact, it's critical. So send your questions to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or submit them to highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. And please tell all your friends about us. And we'd be grateful if you'd leave us a review wherever you listen to our podcast. Until next time, keep learning and growing and give kindness to others and to yourself while we all strive toward the missing piece. It's All Your Fault is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. Music by Wolf Samuels, John Coggins, and Ziv Moran. Find the show, show notes, and transcripts at truestory.fm or highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Mm -hmm.